Mr. Gannon Moore. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Likewise. What are, you, what are you been up to? Oh, yeah, because it's been ages. Um, I got into teaching because, like, when COVID happened, um, I just kind of pulled the brake on leaving New Zealand and continuing to play, like, especially in, like the MLR or anything like that. So I got into, I just had to do a one year post grad because I had my education from before in the States. And then, yeah, got into teaching. How's, uh, how's living in Auckland? How's, how's New Zealand treating you? Oh, uh, I mean, personally, great. Um, some people have been pretty unlucky with like the cyclones and they've had like some flooding. It's been really unfortunate in some places. So we've been pretty lucky because even my school that I'm teaching at had like some damage to like the library. But there's some places where like just roads and stuff got washed away. But um, other, I mean, but other than that, like, you know, I've stayed here for this long because I love it. <laughs> um, you know, found my, found my wife here and um here to stay really so yeah when did you first move out there i played in the that pro league um in 2016 had one season remember it was just called pro rugby there's only like yeah. five teams in it uh, i was with denver um and when that collapsed i was like well what am i what am I doing for, like, how am I going to get better in rugby? And I just made the decision to, I needed to leave the U.S. Um, and then that that season of sevens, we had a fellow that came over from here. Um, his name is Raniera Takarangi. And um, he set me up with Silverdale because that was the last club he played for. Is there ever a world where you see yourself coming back to MLR? I get asked that quite a lot, actually. Oh, do you? Because <laughs> um, I still get, um, I still get interest from teams asking me what I'm doing if I want to come back. Especially also just teammates as well. If the situation was good for the family and, and everything like that, then we would. But you know, it's just um, I feel like it's too good to to leave what i got going on right now so but i'd never like close the door like completely because as long as i still feel like capable i still play i'm still in the mix so don't count me out you know if mananu can still be playing certainly i've got a few years left in me <laughs> you had probably like the best try of that covid year i'm not gonna lie <laughs> uh well thanks that was uh yeah in vegas man that was a it was a fantastic try and, and it was so good that the warriors had you like talking about it for like weeks afterwards and everything <laughs> so yeah i think um oh they like posted something like just last year again too yeah it still seems to come up and it i mean it was such a good team try um you know, and I think it was Basca's first try in the MLR. I just say like it's like why we all play the game. Like when you get those tries, it goes through a bunch of people's hands, and you know, just you know, who doesn't love that? I know that you were in talks with the Houston Texans to play running back for them. Were you? Uh, yeah. Were you? <laughs> were you disappointed when? like you weren't offered a nfl contract how how did that all work out obviously it, it sucked at the time because it's really close and i had like such assurance from the offensive coordinator at the time of the texans that like it was going to happen and then it just came down to the gm for the texans just wanted to sign a local kid instead so that's just the way that's the way it happens like and then even look at the nfl now like running backs like what i was like don't even exist really like the game's changed like so much so i probably would only maybe even play like a season or two even if i did <laughs> <laughs> but i mean yeah it was it was cool but the funny thing about that so when then when i finally did make it into the eagles we were in chicago at soldier field that weekend so Rick Dennison at the time was the offensive coordinator for the Texans. 
he was in the head coach for the Jets and through like another friend of mine um, that that same weekend I got to catch up with him and go down to, to the field and meet a bunch of the players and, and meet him and, and stuff so we had a we actually had a laugh about that as well he was like you know I'm, I'm really sorry and I was like don't be like you know it's, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, it's a business out. decision. I'm here and look at your head coach of the Jets now. Like, you know, we're just in different places. But, you know, he was he was really cool about it. So, you know, big, big shout out to him for that. Your head coach back in in uh, Lincoln and Sioux Falls, uh, Aaron Beavers, right? Yeah. <laughs> what did he give you any advice that you still hold on to now or? Or is there something that like no? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a funny story. Um, I don't know like what sort of people would be listening to this or anybody that would like know that history, but um, that's a pretty funny one. And anybody that that I played with at Lincoln would have had a good laugh with that with that question because um, he. Um, yeah, he was an interesting individual. Like, I actually wasn't even the the starter until the first game of the season. Um, you know, you can never overcome a coach's bias. And I tell young players that all the time. Like, and all you can do is try and just be the best you can and be, like, happy with yourself because you're like, those are just things that you can't control. So it's always like control the controllables. And yeah, like he just didn't like me and or just didn't think I was the one for the part. Um, the starter at the time gets injured like early in the first game of the season. And then my first carry is like a 77 yard touchdown run. And then following week, like the other guy was still injured. And then I had like rushed for like three touchdowns and like 200 and some yards. And then the, just the local papers sort of like blew up and were like, who's, who is this and where did he come from? And why was he on the bench last year? And so, yeah, just things happened that then were out of anybody's control. And we went on to win like a state championship and Lincoln hadn't won a championship since like the seventies. Like we were historically like a, a crap team. And so it's pretty special, those individuals that were a part of that team. Um, but, I mean, just to paint you a picture of the situation, you know how, like, state championships and then they'll bring everybody in to, like, whether it's the gym or the auditorium, parents and everybody comes in, you know, it's like a big celebration and to say thank you to some people. And don't get me wrong, everybody was thanked that, like, deserved it. But then when, like, the superintendent for, like, Sioux Falls Public School came up and then was like, let's thank Aaron Beavers, like, not a single player, like, stood up. Well, at least it taught yeah. you the lesson of, you know, control adversity. the controllables. Yeah, adversity. Yeah, 100%. Oh. So he, yes, to answer your question, he indirectly taught me <laughs> a great lesson in life is that you can never overcome a coach's bias. Don't get me wrong, like, you know, people, <laughs> like I said, that's just the way sports are, right? Because that's why you get guys, even in the NFL, that go undrafted and people say, you know, how did you miss this guy? You know, it's like, it's not that, like, Aaron Beavers had some personal vendetta against me. It was just, that's just how he, he saw it at the time. And that's such a hard thing. For, I think for young athletes to like understand is that like just because it doesn't work out in this role it doesn't mean that you should just automatically give up or, or not mm. continue playing or, or figure out a different way to play it yeah because it's like bottom line is like you're having fun. if you're not having fun like why are you doing it like obviously there's some people that don't get those choices in life but like you need to like really take a step back and be like because I some of my close friends, we would always joke and say that it's pretty nice to get to get paid to play a child's game, because like that's what we're doing. Like, <laughs> like just remember that. Like, 
And for those young players, I always tell them like, like just exactly like you just said, but also it's like, you know, don't give up. But like, if it's also comes time and you want to do something else, you need to have some other skills because you won't, even if you do make it, you can't play rugby forever. So that's just one of those brutal, unless you're Mananu. So were your parents always supportive in you playing collision sports? As far as contact sports, like, yeah, like, I mean, I pretty much just followed in the footsteps of my older brother. I mean, my brother's, I always say this, my brother's the whole reason I ever even got into rugby. If it wasn't for him, um, I wouldn't be here. Um, yeah, because he was like, don't go out for track, come out for rugby. I'll make you a better football player. Mm, yeah, listen to him. <laughs> He's honestly like, it's one of the best rugby players I ever played with. He's of like a generation of rugby players that, you know, if you didn't live in New York, Texas, Florida, or California, you were never going to play for the Eagles. Like, that's just the reality. Like, bef the generation before me. Like, that's not taking shots at anybody. That's just because that's the only places that were playing consistently, you know, and actually had like, where coaches for the Eagles were able to even watch these guys play. Like, um, cause he and I were selected for, uh, Eagles under twenties and we didn't go cause my parents said that's way too expensive. Right. I'm paying for both of you to go do this. Like you guys just play this casually in the, in the springtime. Like we're not paying for this. And the fact that like we had to pay for it, is like when I tell the like Kiwis here, they're just like, "What? It wasn't funded?" Yeah. And it's like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> At college, you played every game of your college career, forty-four games. <laughs> that's that's impressive. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks for doing. Thanks for doing a little bit of research. Yeah, I mean, it's. I was lucky enough to play in every single game, and um. Cause I went into my freshman year, not, I didn't want a red shirt anyway. So luckily I was able to play right away. Cause I would have, even if I would have, I would have just graduated on time. Cause you know, college was just one step. I didn't want to stay there any, long, any longer than I had to. <laughs> that was a great time. I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, yeah, four years of, but you know, I wasn't able to play rugby during that time. Um, that's like the only downside really. Um, but I'd come back and help out like my old high school team, um, in the summertime. So I was still at least able to be around it in some capacity. And then, um, once football was like said and done with, um, yeah, I was like, I, I'm, I still want to do something like, I don't want to just get back into the nine to five and that's it so um i was just was going to like pick up sevens in sioux falls and a fella from kc was was there and he was like hey there's a tournament a sevens tournament in, in denver next week do you want to play and i was like sure and my dad and i drove out there and i played with on their like collegiate side we like beat air force in the final and then it's funny because they actually, um, teams tried to get Kansas City in trouble because they thought that myself and Walt Elder, he ended up uh, playing sevens for USA as well, that they like claimed that we weren't like eligible or like we couldn't be eligible, that we were like some ringers that came out of nowhere that weren't college like players. <laughs> And that's how I ended up in Kansas City then. Kansas City is like a, it's like an amateur league, right? Like it's like the, the different divisions that it has within itself. Like there's a division two that's supposed to be for like people that don't know the game. And then there's the division one, which is like the highest level of amateur rugby. Yeah, because the thing now is it's unfortunate that can't because Kansas City was in the initial talks way back when I say way back. I mean, you know, seven, eight years ago. Um when the MLR would had started and I kind of through just some friends and colleagues and having played in pro rugby, some people did approach me of asking things about like 
um, you know, things like player welfare, stuff like that, because the MLR was like getting started and KC was going to get a team, um, but they just weren't able to um, essentially just get the, the money to do so, because I forget what the initial buy-in was then, and it's gone up exponentially since then. Like it compounds like every year now, <laughs> as far as when a team when a team wants to buy a franchise. But I mean, you understand like they need to they need to make money for the league if it wants to keep yeah. growing. Um, but I knew from the get go that it was going to have success because they got the broadcasting organized, which was massive. Because I mean, that's one of the things that I, in my opinion, like holds back like USA Rugby is how you're able to watch it um because that's people can't watch it then how are they going to know about it and how are they going to care especially if it's not like su super accessible you know is that why pro didn't do so well is because they just couldn't get those licensing agreements oh that's one but it was also just because you had like the way the the system was like set up it was like the the, the guy at the top actually owned all the players contracts so it was like a terrible system. Pro rugby was a sham. It was some guy essentially just trying to get in before the MLR and hopefully that it would take off. And like it, it didn't. I know guys that still have lawsuits actually against that that guy. Wow. <laughs> that league. Because heaps of players didn't get paid what they were supposed to get paid. Ironically, my contract was thrown out two thirds into the season because they just axed a bunch of players on a bunch of the teams and I actually got paid out at the time and then the money obviously ran out <laughs> so then heaps of players that were there to the end didn't get all their money so well, I was just like alright see you later and I went to New Zealand you know what at the time seemed what seemed like shit like for me you know, at the time of being like, oh, well, you know, I must have a lot of work to do since they don't think I've got it. So I was like, well, I just need to, well, how do I become better? And my rationale is, you know, New Zealand just won the last world, last two World Cups at that time. So it must be the best rugby in the world. So that's why I came, that's why I came here. Like that was my reasoning anyways, because I almost went to Australia in like 2015. Do you enjoy more the Southern style, like the Southern Hemisphere style of rugby over like Northern Hemisphere? It's funny being obviously, from, you know, like played in both. Um, I would just say like it is, it's fun from the standpoint of like, like play from anywhere. I feel like it's more of a Southern Hemisphere style, like, you know, playing from, playing from anywhere. Um, South Africa is a little bit different. They're like the outlier because they play a lot more tactical in like how they kick and how they play de uh, defense. But yeah, I mean, just the, the willingness to play. But I feel like the rest of the world, I think in the last like, like five years, five to eight years has really changed. Like so many people are playing that style of rugby now. Like when you look at teams like Japan, Ireland, Scotland, you know, even the way the French have been playing in the last couple of years, like it's not what it was when I first came here, where like New Zealand had this brand of rugby and everyone, a lot of places are playing like catch up, like so many people have caught up. You started playing when you were 15. Was it a club sport? Is that how you guys got started? Yeah, so... Uh, Sioux Falls had a high school team that played in the Nebraska League. So we would have to go down to Omaha or Lincoln, depending on the weekend, and play teams there. And it was like all the Sioux Falls. But we even had kids from like Brandon. Um, I got this kid from Zimbabwe that lived out in, I forget where he he lived now he lived like just out of sioux falls maybe a tour, like outside of del rapids or something um because it was like 20 2007 and i was working at high v like grocery store mm -hmm. and like i i kept putting the world cup on like at break 
and people were everyone else was just like change it whenever i come back but i came back to the break room and this kid's like standing there like watching it and i was like you play rugby <laughs> and then, yeah his family is like from zimbabwe and then got him to play for the sioux falls high school as well when you get to go back to sioux falls i mean do you still help out do you still like coach teams that are there or help out guys that are oh hell yeah so whenever i've um even last time when I was back, I went back for two weeks in July, I think it was. Um, yeah, I, I still popped down to like a training just to help them help them out and stuff. Um, and yeah, if I was ever back in Sioux Falls for like a period, I'd try and help out as much as I could because I feel like that's like one of the cool things about about rugby like doesn't matter what level or what age that you play at it's just about like the sport here for example during club rugby season you could have a super rugby player an all black someone playing on the weekend for their club i remember a few years ago like brad thorne i don't know if you know who brad thorne is like you know won a championship and uh, league and then World Cup as well and played like what would be equivalent of like D2 for like his club because they didn't have numbers and he just came down to training and, and played. And just played because he just, <laughs> yeah. he was there. He was available. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's quite cool. <laughs> and especially like when playoffs happen, then heaps of like super rugby players will be playing for their club. Um, so yeah, it you just never see anything like that in other sports. You played sevens and fifteens. Um, what's the like contrast between the two games? Because obviously, like sevens are are much faster, whereas like fifteens are using more of that like brute force to get around people. I mean, are, are there other like comparisons you can make? What would somebody need to know between those two games? Um, you can be a lot better at sevens by just having really good athletes. I mean, just look at USA 7s compared to USA 15s. Like, that's... Um, and even just look at a lot of other countries that are really competitive in 7s that are non-existent in, like, 15s. Um, like, the, the... What's happened now in the last few years with 15s especially is, like, they just play, like, the percentage and, like... <laughs> and then just play really good defense you know that's why south africa just won the last world cup you know it's almost like dump and run like in hockey i use that reference like sometimes here and no one has any idea what i'm talking about because nobody plays ice hockey but um it's kind of like that it's like you just kind of do that to like reset and you're just more than happy to kind of play defense and reset the table um and, you know and then you'll get like you know the style that like I said, England and South Africa both, where they just t make it and turn it into territory, wait till somebody makes a mistake, and then capitalize on that. Um, which is kind of boring for some people to watch, but it's because I think it's because they don't appreciate the skill that's actually at play. Um, people want to watch. That's why then people really like watching sevens because there's a lot of individual brilliance that happens. Um, not that there can't be like those great team tries because those certainly happen but as someone that's played like both I, I don't know like even at the beginning of this when you talked about like that try like whenever things like that happen it goes through you know five, six, seven pairs of hands to get a try it's it's like why, why we play <laughs> there's something real special about it just because it's yeah, it's the whole team putting forth an effort. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. Like, that's what was so fun about getting like a lot of my football buddies in high school, getting them to come out for rugby. Because it's like, you no, know, you can, you can run, you can pass. You don't have to just block. Because yeah, I just told them the same thing my brother did. I was like, why are we going to go out for track and either, you know, run hundreds, two hundreds, four hundreds, or throw shot or disc? Like, do you want to do that or do you want to play something that's kind of like football? That was a pretty easy sell. But back to Aaron Beavers, they hated that we played rugby. Did they? Hated they? it. 
Yeah, which makes it even that more ironic if you. I mean, I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but if you there is a clip on YouTube from that championship game because I actually do like a an offload for like like a 60 yard touchdown run and we score and it's just like <laughs> honestly it's like icing on the cake and <laughs> just the fact that he hated rugby so much and that play never would have happened in the fashion that it did if it wasn't for rugby i don't want to get like too into it about this guy i don't know him, but <laughs> <laughs> it... get him on the show no <laughs> <laughs> call him up no, uh, it, it's always confusing to me when, like, you have these coaches or whatever that are, like, absolutely not against other sports. But if your team is being a team together in another sport, it just makes it more compatible to do other things that, like, other teams wouldn't anticipate mm. or be waiting for. Can you talk about what a center's position or a center's, like, purpose on a 15s field would be? For Northern Hemisphere people or Southern Hemisphere people? <laughs> Whatever you'd prefer. Dealer's choice, like, my man. Because the one thing I noticed like, here is they'll just say the midfield because 12 and mm -hmm. 13 are just so interchangeable. But like, obviously, Northern Hemisphere is like two different styles. You know, Do you want to have your 12 where your 12 is like just crash ball, crash ball, crash ball? Or is your 12 actually going to be an extension of the of the 10 and you know, you know, being able to direct the attack like as well and be like a kicking option and then you have or is your 13 going to be like that that pure strike runner like how england plays um but one commonality with like all centers doesn't matter what style of rugby you're playing is your ability to play defense i mean people will say it's one of the hardest defensive positions just for the just because of how much is happening to you in real time, like as it's developing. Because I've played 12, I've played 13, I played on the wing, like in, I played in the, in the forwards when I was younger, but at a professional level, I, you know, I've played in all those positions. And playing 13 is definitely, um, you just need to be a much more like aware um, in what's happening because it's like, that's the break point. Like once gets outside of twelve's channel, like it's like that's where the magic happens. That's where teams a lot of times will be having this layered attack that's coming at you. So your head has to be on a swivel and you need to be able to read it. Hearing you talk about it, it sounds like to put it in perspective of like most of the American audience that we have, it it's like a mix between a running back and a linebacker, like mm. kind of getting squished together of like that kind yeah, of individual. like an outside linebacker slash like strong safety. I mean, definitely plenty of, um, I'd say now, like, you know, plenty of running backs, you know, would be like your strike runner of like a 13, but they got to have like the ball skills though as well. So if they don't do that, just chuck them out on the wing and let them be finishers. Because, you know, when you play with 14 other great rugby players, it's pretty easy uh, attacking wise to be out on the wing. Um, but that's one of the things that gets overlooked a lot. And I'd always joke with uh, Kiwis or right the other born players that come to the MLR, I would say, all right, just pick on the wings because there's going to be one of them that have no idea what's going on when, when the kicking game actually starts. So it's gotten way better now, like since I played, um, but you know, it's one of those things like positionally that's um, easy to get caught out. And you still see it happen a lot because you'll get a 10 on. Well, I mean, I feel like every team now in the MLR has a has a 10 that's played test match level rugby um, and they just start abusing a winger <laughs> or like some other team just because he's a great athlete and he can finish. But that's only like one side of the coin. And, um, you know, that's like that's like every position in rugby, but that's just like kind of like a specific one that I can relate to.
when I first started, like the biggest thing that I always saw was that wingers would get sucked in and then they would always leave an outside guy. And it and it always felt like, why are you getting sucked in? But then as I continued to watch and continued to learn the game, it, it was that there was a breakdown failure inside that he had to cover for and then there was nobody to cover for. Yeah, him. so they feel like they need to suck in because one thing I tell guys a lot that play out on the wing is like actually be like almost twice as far out as you think you're supposed you to be supposed because to be. you can you will naturally creep in anyways and the way a lot of defenses are now is like this is what happens in the mlr and part of why like the i think the score line gets so high it's just like there's no rush defense like if you watch like it used to just be the premiership, but now it's it's even they're doing it here because when I first came here, everyone still played like this. Keep it all in front of you, kind of jockey them to the sideline and just kind of play this umbrella like defense instead of actually like shooting up and like think of it like hinging and like closing the gate. So forcing yeah. them to beat you with skill because it's once again that you're playing the percentage have them beat you a skill because if they can do that like hats off to that but if we can you know kill the play before it actually develops um that's been like the i think the biggest significant like especially off of like set piece like defense um in the last like five years when you were in the mlr what was your like were you trying to get a bigger uh, a bigger contract through like a premiership league through like a super sevens league were you trying to like find your way to those other leagues to be a part of those leagues or were you just trying to grow the the um the sport in north america like what were your goals about being there at the mlr being a player there for like the third fourth year i just love rugby <laughs> <laughs> i mean i had a sweet side I, I was pretty fortunate to be able to bounce back and forth between hemispheres and play rugby year round. Um, but it was always about like the growth of USA rugby. I mean, in the end, um, I mean, it's grown so much in just my lifetime of the game. Cause when you look at when I was like 17, a, a rugby scholarship didn't exist. So the fact that like that's available it just shows like the the progress and even though like we didn't qualify for a world cup i think that there's a lot more factors at play than you know just the you know just the mlr i think it's what i said earlier about the rest of the world is getting better at rugby as well but yeah, for me, I mean, it's just that I, I just love love the game. And, um, you know, if I, may, I mean, what's who doesn't want to represent their country and play domestic rugby within their country if they can? It's all about like, even at the time, I didn't know it. It's all about, you know, wanting to play for your, for your country. That's why I said like the biggest punch in the in the gut was when they told me to stay at home and not come to Japan. So, yeah, but said it's just the way just the way it works sometimes this has been awesome i yeah uh we miss seeing you every week for sure but oh i mean i miss it yeah yeah it's just nice to know that i'm still wanted somewhere i guess so that i haven't been forgotten no 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 you're not <laughs> moses out 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 in the not promised land no you can <laughs> <laughs> there's one thing that you can teach your your kid your daughter or your future son if if heaven blesses you so what would be that one thing that you absolutely need them to know um well i mean the greatest advice that my father ever told me was never underestimate somebody's stupidity but in the terms of sports, it's like you have to be doing it because like you love it because it's one of the few things that is like 100% your choice to be doing it because some people never get to play a sport and the fact that you're able to do it, it's like if you don't love it, like, you know, 
you need to be doing something else. So tell anybody else you know that it's keen to come out like working holiday visas or back up and running so if people want to come here for a season and work and play some footy send them well, send them to silverdale 